Okay, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Well, thanks so much to organizers for having me here. I'm really excited to tell you about some of our work. Um, and the theme is ego motion and visual learning. So let's get right in. First, let me start with a story that gives the first part of this work some inspiration. This is a story from cognitive science. This is a study done in 1963 by Heldon Hein about the visual development of some kittens. Okay, so to, to kind of give you the short form of this study, they're looking at kittens raised from birth in the dark, except for, say, an hour a day in which they can spend time on this kitten carousel. And this kitten carousel is constructed in such a way that a pair of kittens goes on, and one is the active kitten. This kitten can move about as it chooses and see what it sees. The other kitten plays the role of the passive kitten, and it is in the carousel in such a way that it'll be forced to follow the motion of the active kitten, but it'll then see what it sees. Okay, so two kittens, one active, one's, one's passive. The active one controls its motion, the other one it does not, but still gets the same visual experience. Okay, so what happens to these two kittens in the end? Well, their visual development is different, despite the fact they saw the same thing. So the active kitten develops normally, the passive kitten is severely stunted in its visual development. What does it suggest? Well, there is some importance to not only what is seen for visual development and perceptual development, but also the context of that, what is seen with self-generated motion. Okay, so it's important to have both in concert to have successful visual development in this study, uh, and that's why the active kitten succeeded, whereas the passive kitten did not. Okay, so I'm a computer vision researcher. This is a study from cognitive science to give some inspiration for the kind of approach I want to show you. But let's contrast this picture and our active kitten and its visual learning here with what we currently do today, by and large, to do visual recognition. Meaning if we want to solve the task, for example, of object recognition, where you give us the system a new snapshot and the system needs to say which objects are present or what scene category am I looking at, well, how is that learning done today? It's done largely as a 2D pattern matching process. And the teaching uh, from we, the researchers, or we, the humans, to these systems takes place in the form of labeled exemplars. Okay, in fact, what I would call bags of disembodied snapshots. So images from the web, we pull them down, we give them labels manually. In fact, we'd like to do it at a large scale, the more the better, and then give them to, a, say, a discriminative learning algorithm to find the patterns that make a dog different than any other of some thousand categories, or a boat different than some other thousand categories. Okay, so there's definitely a, a, a big disparity between the way an active kitten or any other biological visual system would learn and the way we're teaching our visual recognition systems today. Okay, and this is the disparity that we're making some steps to try and close. Okay, so the status quo then is to learn from disembodied bags of labeled, meaning human labeled, snapshots. And this is in stark contrast to what our goal, I think, can be next and should be next, which is to think about visual learning in the context of action and motion in the world. Okay, so this is a very big picture goal, uh, and you can think of it as a form of embodied vision. So bringing vision back into an agent that's moving around in the world, as opposed to an agent that's a classifier looking at labeled images and predicting new patterns. Okay, so that's a goal guiding the kind of research I wanna share with you for my group today. And the things I'm going to cover, first we'll look at how we can take that active kitten as inspiration and learn representations from data uh, by accounting for ego motion. Okay, so we're going to look at unlabeled video and concert with sensors about how a camera's moving in order to do better visual learning. And I'll show the impact for recognition. Then we'll look at removing the need to know from an external source how that camera's moving, but still learn from unlabeled video. Then I'll look at how to not just learn representations based on knowledge of our emotion, but also learn how to move in the future to do active recognition. And finally, I'll share briefly some, some different results we have looking at first-person video, egocentric video, and um, problems like summarization of video. Okay, so here's where we're going. Let me start now right with learning a representation tied to ego motion. So again, if we take that kitten carousel as a very loose inspiration for what we want to achieve, the goal that we have is to try and learn this connection between how I move and how my visual surroundings change. Okay, we'd like to be able to have 
systems that internalize this, links and that, this link and then help us do better for tasks like recognition. So the form this will take then is that we have an egocentric camera. This might be a human-worn camera. Uh, it might be a camera on an autonomous driving platform, as we'll see in some of our results today, or it could be even a handheld camera. Now, along with that video stream coming from such a camera, we'll have sensor data that says how the camera was moving in the world. So the six degrees of freedom for that camera's position in space. Okay, but we want this learning to take place from unlabeled video. And so when I say unlabeled, I mean a human hasn't touched the video to annotate what all is in it. It's just video of perhaps arbitrary content that comes along with this egocentric motor, what I call the motor signal, just meeting where in the world the camera is at each time step. All right, so how, we're going to take this, these two streams of data and try to do an unsupervised learning to help us do things eventually like recognition. So kind of motivate why this would where this could lead us, let's look at this example. So we're gonna, I'm going to cast this in terms of a, uh, the goal to learn how to predict new views as we move. Right? So if I want to know how do my visual surroundings change as a function of my ego motion, it's really a view prediction problem. Where I say, if I'm here and I were to move like this, what would the world look like? So let's imagine ourselves doing that task. Right? So imagine you're sitting in this car, looking out at the world. This is what you see. Now if I then say, well, the camera is going to move in this way, I am sure all of us can start to sketch a view of what the new image is going to look like, right? So you can kind of say, okay, what'll change in the scene? What am I going to see in the new view? Here's the new view that you would see. Now, as you make that mental sketch, what are you drawing on to do it? So how do you know what the new view is going to look like? Well, it's a number of factors. Okay, so one thing is you know about mm, context and semantics. So you know once you see a traffic signal, I'm at an intersection. So Despite the fact it's completely occluded in this view, you might start to hallucinate it or imagine that it's there when you ma make this new view. Furthermore, there's cues certainly about geometry. So the fact that this is further in the scene and this is closer, once that rotation takes place, I know can expect it to be occluded by the tree in the new view. Um, and other things, maybe even mid-level cues like the, the structure of the buildings, the symmetry of the buildings, so it allow you to imagine what it looks like from another view as well. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, learning the connection between how I move and what I see next is capturing things like depth and 3D geometry, as well as semantics and context. And these are all things that are also key to recognition, meaning being able to know what kind of object, what kind of scene am I looking at. And what's really wonderful about that is that learning from unlabeled video is free. Okay, whereas today's systems, we know to do the very best at recognition tests, love to have thousands of exemplars, if not more, for every object category of interest, unlabeled video is free and not manipulated by humans in any way. So if we can learn these kind of aspects from unlabeled video, this could be very important to us for scaling these recognition systems. Okay, so the approach I'll show you then now in a bit more detail is unsupervised feature learning using this unlabeled video and these motor signals. Let me first kind of sketch the approach of what we're after uh, in a couple slides. So we're going to pose this in terms of learning equivariant feature representations that are equivariant with respect to ego motion. So let me define first the special case of equivariance, which is invariance, which I think we know much more um, closely. So often we're trying to learn invariant features. What does this mean? It says we'd like to learn some feature mapping Z that when applied to our feature or our input images X, um, even after undergoing some transformation G, we'll get similar representations. Okay, so we might like a representation that's invariant to translation, rotation, so that you can change the images but still get the same feature signal back. Okay, and this is the notion behind many of the feature learning approaches that are being developed and are quite successful. Now, when I talk about learning an equivariant feature representation, this is a generalization of invariance, where instead of trying to discard the effects of these transformations G, we want to preserve them and let them be represented in simple and predictable ways in the learned feature space Z. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that we'll have to learn um, not only the feature mapping Z that maps my images into some embedding space, but also recover a series of simple here linear equivariant maps that um, are paired with the different ego motions, in our case G or ego motion transformations, um, for each of the ego motions. Okay, so what does it say? We're not throwing away the changes that G um, 
puts upon our input x, but we're organizing them in a simple way here through a linear mapping in this learned feature space z. Okay, so the goal of our work and, and the method I'll show you is to learn both these maps m as well as the feature mapping z. So in short, invariance will discard information, equivariance will organize it. So let me draw a picture of what I'd like the approach to achieve to learn these equivariant feature maps. So again, we have unlabeled video as input. Here, this is video from the Kitty data set, which consists of an autonomous driving platform driving around, capturing the video. And we have motor signals like the heading of the vehicle, the GPS coordinates of the vehicle. So imagine here just plotted as some 1D signal. So we're learning from this video. There's no semantic labels. In fact, it can be from um, arbitrary semantic content. And what we'd want to do from this unlabeled video is learn this equivariant feature space that'll have the property that new images are all organized in the space as a function of the, the ego motions that separate them. So in other words, if you have pairs of video frames that are related by a similar ego motion, they should be related by the same feature transformation in our learned feature space Z. So as a picture of that, imagine we had some frame that looks like this. Then after, say, a series of three different ego motions, a left turn, a right turn, or going forward, we would have predictable mappings in this feature space that relate those new views to an original view. So moving forward, moving to the left, to the right. And this should be the same then for any such pairs of, of frames. So to the point where if you give me a new frame, if I've done this equivariant feature learning well, when I map into this learned space, I can predict what the thing will look like as I undergo any of those ego motions. Okay, so this is the goal. Now we, have to, we want to then learn, do the learning that would provide you with just such a feature space so that you come in with any new arbitrary, new unlabeled image from this video or otherwise that you can map it into this space and benefit from the representation that's been learned. Okay. So the way we do this learning in one slide looks like this. So unlabeled video comes in. We know the ego motions that separate any pair of frames, forward, left turn, right turn, whatever it is. Then we're learning this equivariant feature space as our goal. So we need to learn the parameters theta for this mapping z, as well as learn these equivariant maps m. And during, for the unsupervised learning part of this, then we have these frames, um, say xi, and then xi after it undergoes ego motion g, a left turn in this pair. These will come in as training pairs. And we learn, in our case, we're learning this embedding as a deep neural network, a convolutional neural network. So the parameters theta that we're learning are all the parameters within the layers of this network. Okay. So we're going to use a, we use a Siamese architecture, so these are the same parameters in both stacks here that we're going to learn that will then come, take as input x and gx and then learn the parameters for this mapping z. And what this equivariance goal says is that the parameters need to be such that after also learning uh, a linear mapping m for each of the ego motions g, then there should be um, a low loss between the, the, the remapped feature z after undergoing ego motion g. So this would give us an equivariant mapping. I'm not showing all the details here. For one, this needs to be a contrastive loss so that we don't have the trivial solution of just producing zero mappings for these. Okay, so pairs of frames in, embedding uh, parameters out, as well as these equivariant maps, to give us an equivariant mapping for the feature space. Now that's the unsupervised part of the learning. Since I also would like to use this learned representation to do a recognition task, alongside I'll have a small number of class-labeled images. So images for which I know what object or scene category is present. And this will be the supervised training that we'll do jointly with this unsupervised feature map learning, which means, in other words, the, the parameters of this mapping need to be such that equivariance is possible, but also classification is possible in this learned space. Okay, so the parameters W are the classifiers that we're learning alongside. Okay, so we, we show how we can jointly then train these two, two goal, train for these two goals, unsupervised learning for equivariance as well as supervised training for the recognition task. Okay, so this has given us an ego motion equivariant feature uh, space. You can map new images in no matter their source. So let me show you some example results using this learned space, which again is really just trying to capture how I move in the world and what I'm going to see differently, which will again give us all those cues about context, semantics, geometry in this learned space. 
Let's use it to learn from unlabeled video from the kitty data set. This is the, the car, the video taken from a car driving around. And then try to do a visual recognition task here on the Sun data set, which consists of about 400 different scene categories, like the ones you see here. So at test time, we're going to be given an image. We need to say, is it a library? Is it a bus? And, and so on, among five, 400 categories. And now notice these two <coughs> domains aren't, aren't closely linked, um, driving around in the streets versus these 400 diverse categories. But we expect we can learn uh, about ego motion and what we're going to see from the unlabeled video and do better on this task than if we were to rely on small numbers of labeled examples alone for the sun images. Okay. So what kind of results do we get? Can this actually help us do recognition? So first, let's look at this transfer between the kitty unlabeled video to the sun scene recognition. And the leftmost result here is chance performance. So if you have 400, the 397 classes, here's your chance accuracy. If you were to do supervised learning with everything else the same as our approach, but lacking the unsupervised learning component, this is how well you can do using just six labeled exemplars per class. Okay? Now you can do better if you use an invariant feature representation learned from also the same unlabeled video that we use, but promoting invariance rather than equivariance. Because this is a more traditional thing to do, in fact, done by these, um, these two earlier works, learning features from unlabeled video. So much better. Now, if you take our approach and learn ego motion equivariant features, we get uh, a very strong gain even over those invariant feature learners. Okay, so this is quite exciting. We're learning from unlabeled video and getting these kind of gains. So just using labeled data, we're down here. Using the unlabeled video, which is free, we're getting up to this accuracy level. Okay, and we've done this with different combinations of data sets. Here I'm just showing, highlighting this one, but different pairings will give us similar kinds of gains. Okay. Altogether, about 30% better than the invariant feature learning approach. All right, so this is, uh, let me pause and kind of recap what I've shown you so far. We've looked at a new unsupervised feature learning approach that tries to take a step towards an embodied approach to feature learning. Okay, embodying that we pay attention to how the camera is moving when we learn these features. And then we saw that for recognition tasks, like the one I just showed, we can exploit this equivariant feature matching to do a better job, especially and particularly when the amount of labeled data is small. And you might say, well, I'm happy to label images. Maybe none of us are really going to say that, but we might say it's possible to label many images. In fact, we've done a lot of... You know, as a community, we've done a lot of work getting crowdsourcing to the point where we can label many images. However, there still exists, even once we're willing to do that, the fact that many object categories are in the long tail, meaning there's many object categories in the world we'd like to be able to recognize for which we can't even obtain many, many exemplars, let alone spend the labeling time to label them. So this is a very important case of scarce labels for categories that uh, unlabeled video has a lot of potential to help. In future work in this, in this direction, what we'd like to think about is volition for our system at training time, too. So in other words, the active kitten is active not only in terms of um, knowing about its own motion, but also choosing how it moves as it's doing its visual learning. And that's not something that's present yet in what I showed you so far. OK, so this is a recap so far. Now, the next thing I want to show you is to think about um, how to remove the need for this external sensor data so that we could learn from arbitrary unlabeled video. OK, so who's this guy? Well, this is what I've shown you so far in that we're able to learn from unlabeled video accompanied by these ego motion motor signals. Right? So we're aware of our motion, and we do better visual learning. What I'd like to get to next is this guy. OK, so this is a couch potato. So he is not only watching unlabeled video, but he's also not thinking about his motion. In other words, he's not controlling the motion. He's just observing passively whatever unlabeled video comes in front of him. Can we do better feature learning with such data? We'd like to, because this would mean that I don't have to rely only on cameras that were instrumented with these external sensors, but I could also use any legacy data, any YouTube videos, arbitrary video that has no labels on it. Okay, so this is a good practical goal. So let me show you how we can next approximate that kind of equivariant feature map learning, but now without the requirement of external sensor data for the motor signals. And the approach I'll show you builds upon and generalizes the concept of slow feature learning, or slow feature analysis. So let me give you a little bit of background about that concept before I show you our approach. So slow feature analysis says that 
there's a hypothesis that if, if I have some quickly varying signal here, x, that I observe, that in a representation, say, uh, uh, a representation that's useful, those signals would be slowly varying. Okay, and I'll give you an example in a minute. But the idea would be, can we find, in slow feature analysis, can you find a function g that will map what is a quickly varying input signal as, with respect to time over here, x, to a slowly varying output signal y? Now, notice that this goal is not a matter of smoothing, right? We're not looking to smooth the function, the function outputs x or the observations x. This is something that has to be independently done at any time slice. So you give me one x, I give you one y. And the goal would be to have some feature mapping function g that's recovered that, that yields outputs y that are slowly changing in spite of the quickly changing x. Okay, so that's slow feature analysis in general. Let's look at what it might mean for the visual world here, say, is a video of a monkey. The monkey's here. He's moving a little bit to the left, and then he's out of the field of view. So in this case, the input that's quickly varying is the image frames of the video, x. And the slow changing signal is the high-level semantics. So for example, the fact, the parameter that says whether a monkey's present or not over time, or the parameter that says the position of the monkey over time within the frame. So a good feature representation could be to learn the mapping from x to y that gives you the slow varying function, which, so, which is the, the semantic parameters that we care about. Okay. So this very concept for video has been explored in a number of pieces of work um, some years ago and re being re reinvestigated today with the concept of invariant feature learning. Okay, and we said, I said earlier what, what this idea was. Here in video, the nice thing is you know that the semantics can only change slowly for the most part. All right, so if I have continuous video, the semantics like the place of the monkey or whether the monkey's present, that's going to change slowly over time. So in the world of feature learning, what this means is that you give me adjacent frames and I can learn a representation where those frames should be close together or slowly changing representation where they're close. Okay. And so this has been explored in a number of different ways. You take um, adjacent frames or near adjacent frames and require that the learned representation keep them close together. This would give you invariance to whatever quick changes happened in the measured video frames. Okay, the problem is this invariant feature learning or temporal coherence approach fails to capture how the content's changing over time. Okay, so this leads to our idea, which generalizes slow feature analysis to slow and steady feature analysis uh, to look at higher order temporal coherence. Okay, so we're going to look at not just the, the instantaneous change from frame to frame, but look at the changes of those changes and say we expect that as things change, not only do they change slowly, but their changes change slowly as well. So for example, if we look at second order slowness, then that would mean looking at triplets of frames, right? So we look at not just A and B, but A, B, and C and say that the change from A to B should be similar as the change from B to C. And that means if you think about writing down what you want to happen in your learned feature space, you would have small change between these pairs within the triplet. Okay. So without it going into the implementation, um, how we do this, you can think of another feature learning approach. Now this ends up being a, a, a stack of a triplet Siamese embedding because you have to take these triplets of pairs when, or triplets of frames when we're doing the learning. So what does it mean? It means now we do have a couch potato learner because it will watch unlabeled video, take this second order temporal coherence as our objective for feature learning, and return an embedding where basically over time we can expect collinearity with the embedded frames. Right? So there's this known uh, preserved relationship with larger neighborhoods of frames to say that the changes are changing slowly. And while I won't go into the details right now, this, the property of equivariance that we were seeking originally we can say is approximately preserved by the second order temporal coherence, or what we're calling the steadily varying frame, frame features. Okay, so, so far I've shown you feature learning from uh, the video plus the ego motion sensors. Now we're looking at results where we're learning just from the unlabeled video. So let me show you a few different data set pairings that allow us to test this idea. So on the one hand, we have unlabeled video from the human motion database. So these are mostly web videos that have been collected um, contain humans doing various things. And 
This would be the unlabeled video source. Our system just needs to watch that video and learn its representation. And then at test time, the system will need to be able to take a few labels from this other data set, which is called Pascal. These are static images of people doing different activities. Now, importantly, there need not be any overlap in the activities that take place over here in the video and the activities that take place over here in the new Pascal action classification challenge. Right? This video is unlabeled, and it may not even contain the same classes. But we expect to be able to learn a useful prior for how things, uh, or how to represent things from the unlabeled video. Similarly, pairings like the one I showed you before, like the kitty video over here during learning, and then the scene classification tasks during test time, or things like this toy data set called NORB, um, where the object's actually on a turntable uh, to simulate the motion of the camera moving around it. So I'm going to show you two things, two results using data like this. The first one will look just for fun at a sequence completion task. The second one will look at um, what we can do for recognition on these different tasks. <coughs> so sequence completion. Now remember, the whole goal here is to learn how things look as I move or how things evolve over time as I watch unlabeled video. So let's look at a sequence completion task where the system's going to be given a pair of frames that comes from a real video, and it needs to infer what the next frame would look like. So you can call it future prediction or just looking forward in time from what we've just seen most recently. And this is very simple in terms of what we need to implement here because we have this embedding Z that's preserving uh, collinearity of the, the, the learned representations for these frames over time. Okay, so if you want to know what things look like at time step three, it's a simple function of what we just saw in frame time one and time two in this learned space. That is if the learning has succeeded. Okay, so here are two low-res frames from frame one, frame two. If you can't tell because of the resolution, this is a woman doing some kind of acrobats on her arms. Okay, so maybe a cartwheel is happening. Now the job then of the system is to pull back and show us what frame three would look like in this embedding space. The first frame we, we say it might look like is here. Our next two guesses look like this. Okay, this bar means this actually was the true frame that we, have, we in this case, got correctly as our first guess. Here are a couple more examples. Again, time one, time two, and then what we, what we think is going to happen next. Okay. So we can see the system qualitatively here, and of course we can quantify this as well. The system's able to understand what it's going to see next because of this learning we've done on unlabeled video. Okay, and I should stress this is on unlabeled video that need not have any of these same actions, and certainly not the same people, um, as the ones at test time here. Okay, so that's sequence prediction. Now let's look at what happens when we take these slow and steady features and apply them for recognition. Okay, again, so these are the three data set pairings I showed you a minute ago, NORB, scenes, and actions, so three different kinds of tasks. And they have 25, 400, or 10 different categories present. So here's random chance performance on the recognition task. Uh, if you were to just, again, do supervised learning in a standard way, everything else the same as our method, but not using the unlabeled video to learn, here are the accuracy rates you achieve. If you were to do invariant feature learning, again, same baselines I showed you earlier from existing work, you get much better results. But if you furthermore do the, what we're proposing, the slow and steady feature analysis, we can do much better. Okay, so this is very encouraging, saying that for free unlabeled video, accompany your small amounts of labeled data, you get a very big boost in what you can do for recognition. And that's the boost from here in this row of the supervised method to the method that also knows how to use the unlabeled video. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So this shows that across these diverse tasks, there's good promise for this kind of unlabeled, unsupervised learning. Let me show you what's really my favorite result in terms of um, promise for the future in this kind of methods using the, the, uh, a twist on the approach I just showed. Okay, so for those who aren't familiar, let me try to set the stage of what, it, what most of us do today in object recognition when we want to build the system to do the next recognition task. And it's this idea of using a pre-trained representation. Okay. So let's say that you care about a new task for recognition. You want to recognize these, again, 400 scene categories and images, say. Hey? And you have relatively few labeled exemplars for each one. Now, if you were to try to learn a deep neural network or a convolutional neural network using these few labeled ex examples, you'll, your system will fail. There won't be enough labels and labeled data so to support the number of parameters in the system that you need to learn. So you can't stop there. And what people will do instead is take this somewhat surprising but now very commonplace or commonly exploited 
finding that we can use supervised pre-training from a related domain to basically initialize the parameters in this convolutional neural network to then do learning with few labeled exemplars. Okay. So the supervised pre-training, this is the potato who works hard labeling images. And so you have all, say, ImageNet as your uh, original labeled data source. And you train the parameters of a network to do that task, that related recognition task. Now, that's not the task you cared about. You wanted to do this new one instead. So the idea with pre-training is to start with the parameters learned for this older related task and then fine-tune them towards for classifiers that will then succeed for your new task. And this, many, many people have shown, would be much better than, say, randomly initializing these parameters and trying to find your solution there. Okay? And why is it better? Well, there's, the intuition is there's semantics here that are generic and large-scale enough in terms of number of categories that they can help on this related task. OK, so that's what we would do off the shelf and is very quite successful for supervised pre-training. So now what we're asking is, can we do this in an unsupervised way? So can this pre-training come from our un unsupervised learner who just watches the video? And can we use those initialized parameters to then do well uh, on this new task? Okay. So we'd like to see that not only could we compete with the supervised pre-training, which, by the way, costed that supervised pre-training of millions of labeled exemplars costed much effort and much time to achieve. So can we not only match that, but could we even do better? Because there's no limit, really, on the amount of unlabeled video I could collect. So if more of it's useful and it can even outperform that supervised approach, this would be very exciting. So let me show a hint to where that's going uh, in this result. So here we're looking at recognition accuracy on the y-axis. Um, and for now, ignore the x. So here, this is what you get on that Pascal Action Recognition Challenge, just using a few labeled exemplars um, for those particular categories. Okay? So now if you use our approach by watching that unlabeled human motion database of video, we get the accuracy um, much higher. Now, if you look at that competing standard approach, um, here are the invariant feature learnings, if you look at the the supervised pre-training approach, and you think about adding more and more labeled exemplars to that pre-training data. Again, this is going to be data from some related, but not the identical recognition task. What you'll see is the more labeled data you add, the better things get. But in this case, even when we go to the max of the data available for this data set, 50,000 labeled exemplars, it's still inferior, in fact, to what we can do with this unsupervised pre-training idea. So this is exciting. Um, it's a starting point, not an end point, but it's suggesting where we can go to move towards representation learning that looks at unlabeled data. OK. So now let me show you how we can think about not just learning from how we move, but then choosing how we move. Okay. So if we, want to have, if we understand this connection between ego motion and what we see, this suggests that we can be smart about how we move so we see the things that are most useful to us. Okay, and this is the very idea behind the classic challenge of active vision, in particular active recognition, where you think about not as being a passive observer trying to label snapshots from the web, but instead being a, a, a mobile vision system on a robot or a vehicle or a manipulating robot who's able to move the object or move itself in smart ways to do better and faster recognition. Okay, so this is a challenge that's been around for a long time, and yet, and yet really quite dormant in the modern visual recognition community. And I think with kind of these kind of techniques, we have potential to revisit them and do much more and broaden the scope of what recognition even means as a challenge. So I'll show you two examples of how we're doing that, drawing on this kind of methods I just showed you. So the first is the next best view selection problem. So imagine you're a system looking at this image. There might be ambiguity about what category you're looking at. Is it a cup? Is it a pan? Is it a bowl? Now, if your system knows about its connection between how I move and how things change, then you can imagine good motions that would let you disambiguate what you're seeing. Right? So the next best view selection is saying, if I were to move next, where should I move so that I get the answer right? Um, and we can take some simple approaches using those equivariant embeddings I showed you, because remember, they're giving us exactly that. They tell us how do, you, how do things going to look if you move, and we don't have to move to know what that, what that new, look, new appearance is going to be. 
And our accuracy here is better, than, again, similar baselines I showed you before, doing this next view, best viewed task. Uh, more recently, we're thinking about this in 3D environments. So imagine that I have an agent standing in this scene, and it has a complete 3D panorama, uh, 360 panorama surrounding it. And its decision now is where should it glimpse in the scene? Where should it turn its head in order to know what kind of scene it's standing in? Same kind of task. It's an active recognition task. Um, but now we need to decide where to point the camera within this. Here's an unwrapped panorama of the 360 view. And the idea, of course, is that you want the series of the fewest many glimpses in order to know where you are. And this require, doing this well requires all the stages you see here, selecting the action, where to move, um, processing those views, aggregating the evidence over time, looking ahead to make the prediction about what things will look like, and then integrating all of those um, estimates to make the prediction of the category. And the idea we have here is to try and learn all of this end to end. So in essence, learn a policy for ego motion in this 360 panorama environment to do active recognition of the scene category. And one of the keys to the approach is this idea of being able to do look ahead. Um, that equivariant feature mapping that says, well, let's, let's regularize the way we learn this policy to say the kind of representation you learn internally should be one where it's predictable how things look when you move. Okay, and I'm, I'm skipping the details here for time, um, but I'll show you uh, a qualitative example of what this means we can do now. So here is a 360 panorama, just unwrapped as a bunch of tiles, and they're organized by the viewpoints. So here are the, the, the direction the camera's looking as organized along this axis here. And here's one little glimpse. So one of these squares up here corresponds to one of the pink square down here. And at any given time step, this yellow region denotes the next views that the agent might choose. Okay. So where should it point its camera among those next views? And at this moment, our system thinks that it's probably looking at a restaurant or a train or a shop. Uh, the true answer is plaza courtyard. So the next active choice it makes is to move the camera from looking down to the left to now looking down to the right, see something new, aggregates that evidence, and then its policy tells it where to move next. At this point, it's updated its beliefs. Its courtyard is its third guess. It makes one more choice to look up a bit and sees this wall, and all of a sudden is very com rather confident that it is looking at a courtyard. Okay. So this is a, a, a take on using these kind of representations and, in fact, learning the policy so you know how to make ego motions that are most informative. Okay. All right, so, so far I've showed you ways in which we're working towards this goal of learning in the world with action and motion. Um, with continuous self-acquired feedback. And the new technical things I pointed you to, one, this idea of embodied feature learning from unlabeled video, and then the, the extension and generalization, looking at higher order temporal coherence without the motor signals, and then these, this idea, most briefly, about active policies for next best view selection. Now, before I finish the last part of the talk, I wanted to share with you, shifting gears a bit, um, some of the work at a very high level that we've been doing for first-person video analysis. Okay, so here we're looking at mm, understanding the motion and the activity of the person wearing, a person wearing the camera, whereas all the results I've shown you so far happen to have been from ego cameras on a vehicle um, or handheld cameras. So in general, I've been quite interested in first-person vision, which is which, what even led us to this, this idea of ego motion and visual learning. Um, and I believe there's really kind of a renaissance and new opportunities for what is possible and of interest to do with a wearable camera. So here's a smattering of applications, things like we might Im immediately think of, like augmented reality, but also others, like um, as we're seeing increasing use of body cams by law enforcement or defense analysts, uh, as well as in science, if you think about infants, just like our kittens in the beginning, infants who are instrumented with wearable cameras give us a really valuable perspective on visual development in humans, of course robotics, and also in life logging. So there's all ways in which we really care about analyzing the video coming from these wearable cameras. And what's very interesting as a computer vision person is how different this data is from the kind of data many of us have been using for quite a while. So on the left is a third-person view of a mall scene. And on the right is a first-person view of a similar scene, but now from this dynamic person in the environment and interacting with it. And you know, at a glance, these are very qualitatively different forms of data. Static camera roughly on the left, dynamic camera on the right, and on the right you're getting all these 
challenges, but also cues about what the person was attending to, what they even touched, um, and, and how the activity is really unfolding in front of them as an active participant. And this is very exciting um, so to, for visual analysis, because now we can exploit these things and do new tasks. Okay. So one of the tasks that we've been working on is summarization. Take a very long video as input from the egocentric view, and then produce a storyboard summary or some short video as output. Okay, so you can take hours of this egocentric video, come out with a short storyboard as a summary. And the reason we'd like to do this is, well, for, in my case, I was inspired by the notion this might help someone with visual Mem or, sorry, with memory impairment, be able to recount their visual experience, but also kind of domains like law enforcement you, or others, we can imagine summaries of these videos would uh, supply you with a way to meaningfully index these very, very long video collections. So what I'm showing you here is a keyframe summary on the right that's automatically computed from, in this case, three hours of egocentric video on the left. And I'm not, sh I'm not telling you at all about the methods here, I just kind of want to highlight the type of things that we're doing um, and what you should see is kind of the story of the day unfolding through these algorithm-selected frames that are most informative. Okay, a story of driving and shopping and cooking and eating and so on. Okay. In the similar vein, we care about trying to decide, well, when should the camera even take a photo? Okay, if you wear a camera, one of the beautiful things is you're not controlling it. Um, but that means it needs some smarts about what it should even capture. So here are some some video where we're, our system, whenever it freezes, decides it has found a frame that looks like a human taken photo. Okay, it may not be, uh, need not be a beautiful photo, it just looks like a well-composed photo that if you were controlling the camera, you might have taken. So there's another one. And it's doing this in a very lightweight way, just uh, a data-driven way, looking at how the statistics of the frame currently in view correspond to those of the kind of photos people take. Okay, and you can see how this might also lend itself to summarization. And the last thing I'll show you is some, a very recent idea we have to look, again, at analyzing this first-person video and understanding what's going on behind the camera. Okay, so what does seeing this video tell you about the person that's wearing the camera? Well, a number of things. The one we're trying to capture is here there's a chest-mounted camera. Here there's some egocentric video coming in. Can we actually estimate the body pose over time of the person wearing the camera? Okay, so the last result I'll show you uh, is the result of doing just this. So it's a learning-based approach. We've learned how to relate what the person's seeing over time to their body pose. So here's our estimate of the body pose. This is the ground truth. And here are a number of baseline methods, including deep learning methods that are uh, attempting the same thing, uh, that we implemented to attempt the same thing. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, I've showed you basically two things. One, the idea of learning representations from unlabeled video and being aware of the ego motion when doing so. And two, just a glimpse of the kind of work we're doing uh, on the more analysis side to know what's, hap what, what's present in the egocentric video that we capture. And thanks for your attention. Glad to take any questions.